So welcome everyone to uh, Grand Rounds, and as I always uh, say, thank you very much. I so much appreciate all of you taking your time to come to Grand Rounds and learn, and we have a fantastic Grand Rounds today. So I can't break from protocol. My uh, meteorological report is not very creative today, but I will say five days until spring. And on that Wednesday, it is going to be above average. So that is fantastic for temperature. I also want to remind all of you, we are in our third candidate interview for the interim, for the permanent chair of medicine. That candidate is Dr. Lynn Schnapp and she will be doing her academic seminar today at noon in HSLC 1305. And so that is open to all of you. Uh, please feel free to come and meet Dr. Schnapp. And again, I want to remind all of you that everyone who sees our candidates has a voice uh, in who our next chair is, so please send your comments in. So with that, we are about to embark on the Gary and Marie Weiner Visiting Lecture Series. And what I'd like to just spend a couple minutes talking about, I, I, in my mind I thought this was year three, but Pete just told me it's actually year six of this Visiting Lecture Series. And this is a great example of how the generosity of philanthropy and the kindness of people uh, giving to the academic mission of the Department of Medicine makes us better. And it makes us better in the academic work of what we do. So this kind of visiting uh, lecture series and professorship allows us the ability to bring in people who are state of the art that we may not be able to bring in otherwise. Uh, so the Winders, Mr. and Mrs. Gary and Marie Weiner are here today. I would like to just thank them for their generosity. <laughs> and with that, Dr. Uh, Benjamin is going to be our Grand Rounds speaker, and I would like uh, the Division Chief from Cardiology, Dr. Mohammed Hamden, to introduce him today since they are connected. And thank you all for being here. <clears throat> it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Benjamin, a colleague and a friend that I've known for more than 20 years. Uh, Ivor went to medical school at John Hopkins. Uh, he did his residency at Yale, and then he did his cardiology fellowship at the University of Chicago. And following his cardiology fellowship, he did a research fellowship in molecular biology, both at Duke and UT Southwestern. In, 2000, in uh, 1991, he was recruited to UT Southwestern as an assistant professor. And uh, 12 years later, he became a full professor with tenure. In 2003, he was recruited to the University of Utah as the Christie Smith Endowed Chair and Division Chief for Cardiovascular Medicine. He stayed in Utah for 10 years, and then he was recruited to the Medical College as Director of the Cardiovascular Center and Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine. In addition, he served as a Vice Chair for Translational Research, and he held an appointment in the Departments of Physiology pharmacology and toxicology, cell biology, and surgery. Uh, Dr. Benjamin's research early on was focused on prevention of cancer treatment-related cardiotoxicity. Later on, most of his work was related to stress protein and ischemic heart disease and reductive stress. And more recently, he received a $4 million grant from the AH Endowment, which is Advancing a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment uh, aimed at promoting, basically, the future physician scientist. He has more than 100 publications in high-impact journals, and he certainly trained many students, fellows, and junior faculty. His research work was recognized at many levels. When he was a junior faculty at UT Southwestern, he received the Early Career Development Award from the American Federation for Medical Research. Uh, in 1997, he received the Established Investigator Award from the American Heart Association, and in 2009, the NIH Director's Pioneer Award, which is a very prestigious award. In addition to his uh, research, he's been a great citizen. Uh, he served as section editor for Cecil's Essential of Medicine, uh, the sections on medicine and molecular biology, and the section on cardiovascular diseases. He's also a consulting editor for the Journal of American Heart Association. He's on the editorial board of several journals, including CERC, CERC Research, JCI, and Journal of the American Heart Association. And as I mentioned earlier, he served in many leadership roles and committees including the American Federation for Medical Research, where he served as the Chair for Education Committee, uh, the Stanley Sarnoff Society for Cardiovascular Research, the Chair of the Scientific Board, 
He was the president of the Association of University Cardiologists in 2016. And at the AHA, he kind of went up the ranks uh, over the years. Uh, he served as the president first of the Dallas Division of Texas Affiliate. Then he chaired the Scientific Publishing Committee and the International Committee. And this year, he's the president of the American Heart Association. Dr. Benjamin gave a CVM grand rounds yesterday, and it was an outstanding grand round where he focused on the inequalities in healthcare delivery and, and the role of the AHA in promoting, of course, physician to physician scientists. So today he's going to be talking about protein misfolding diseases, lessons from Alzheimer's to cardiomyopathy. I will. Well, good morning. Normally that's called a shout and response, but that's okay. I'm still in Wisconsin. <laughs> but let me just say how enormously privileged and humbled I am to uh, be here this morning, not only with uh, friends who I've uh, admired and respected, obviously Dr. Rick Page has been a friend of mine who a colleague for over 30 years, Dr. Mohammed Hamden. I so graciously appreciate your kind words and being part, you know, being the grand round speaker this morning. But just as importantly, as Mohammed said, um, I've been on this amazing journey. And I want to begin by, of course, um, just mentioning that um, as much as I'll tell you a little bit about protein misfolding diseases, it lessens some Alzheimer's to cardiomyopathy. I'm also going to put um, some context of um, how my own um, thinking about um, health, cardiovascular health, global health, uh, has evolved um, in my position as the president of the American Heart Association. But I also wish to um, begin by expressing both enormous thanks and appreciation uh, as the visiting professor um, endowed by um, Gary and Marie Weiner. I had a chance to um, speak with the Weiners um, earlier, and I can't tell you how much um, I was touched by their graciousness. I was touched with the sense that um, they responded to um, what they called um, the infectious, um, the first, I think he said contagious, but um, just in terms of the enthusiasm that Dr. Page had for enhancing professionalism, and just as importantly, to um, be sure that um, much of uh, what happens here at UW-Madison in terms of the quality of the science, in terms of your commitment to public health, is, um, is, is, is universally shared. And um, I've always appreciated that about the institution, but uh, really being able to have um, two outstanding individuals of the community who um, are willing to invest and be able to create this opportunity for me to be here is, is really something that I greatly appreciate. Well, um, you know, uh, there is another slide I have to show here that uh, I have no uh, disclosures or unapproved rules. And just as well um, to talk a little bit more about um, the objectives for today's Grand Rounds. My hope would be that um, as much as my um, academic career has uh, informed me to talk a little bit about um, cardiovascular disease and neurodegenerative disease, what I really want to um, for you to leave here with is a is a is a is a some concept of the about the challenge and the opportunities that we have, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of those um, research um, priorities. As is customary for, for Grand Rounds, I'm just going to just put up um, three cases here that sort of describes um, what um, today's um, talk is going to focus on. And, and it's unusual that you have a cardiologist who is thinking about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I, I, I assure you that, um, you know, except for some moments when, you know, my family will tell me, well, you know, Dad, how did you forget that? Um, <laughs> I, I, I hope that this is something that's particularly well informed. Well, the first is a 58-year-old woman with a history of cognitive impairment for 10 years and a clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease for seven. The next case is a 70-year-old woman with clinical diagnosis of AD confirmed at autopsy. So CERAD is simply a way, it's a registry, it's using basically various diagnostic markers for Alzheimer's disease. And the last is this, a four-year-old man with a clinical diagnosis for three years 
And when they removed the heart, there was actually potentially evidence that um, there were some of these same processes that are happening in the brain can also be potentially um, in the heart. So I'm going to be able to come back to some of these um, issues uh, in, the in, the quality in the Q and A section. So look, I mean, I've got good news for you, right? And everyone in this room is quite familiar. This is just a um, slide that shows about the f absolutely phenomenal progress that we have been able to make in this country and even worldwide in terms of treating cardiovascular disease and stroke. Over the last um, 30, 40 years, there's probably been close to a 70% absolute risk reduction in terms of mortality and morbidity for, for, for cardiovascular disease as well as stroke. And of course, this is thanks um, to the phenomenal research uh, that has led to medical breakthroughs, both in terms of diagnostics, both in terms of uh, therapeutics, both in terms of devices, and a whole host of ways that we've been able. So we've got a lot to really um, celebrate um, for. And of course, um, I think um, as, a, as a cardiovascular um, physician scientist, as well as just you know being able to sort of be a consumer, we know that um, we are maybe cardiovascular disease is the forefront of what we call evidence-based medicine. We're able to basically ask whether therapeutic um, has a, a, a potential uh, efficacy by randomized controlled trials, and there's no other discipline that is as effective and as compelling to really be able to show that there is evidence for true interventions than in the cardiovascular uh, field. That being said, there is also a tsunami that's approaching us, and that has to do, if you will, when we think about Alzheimer's disease and cognitive impairment. Today, there are 5.7 million Americans with Alzheimer's, and by the year 2050, that number will triple. When you think about the fact that in um, cardiovascular disease, we've got landmark trials, and the folks who are more familiar, we've got landmark trials in the cardiovascular area in terms of things that really work. They have been over 400 clinical trials that are tackling various aspects of Alzheimer's disease, and there's not a single one that has actually been able to show compelling e efficacy, notwithstanding what you see on late night TV. So the point here is that, you know, we've got a real challenge, and particularly with the aging of the population, um, there is just really um, an absolute commitment, and as you know, uh, both at the national level as well as, of course, uh, many other um, organizations, and I'll tell you a little bit about what the American Heart Association is doing, is actually investing in this space because the discoveries are going to have to come with us having a better understanding about the disease processes so that we can have better insights to really be able to tackle uh, the root uh, underlying cause. It's not so, um, you, know, it's, it's, you know, I don't have totally um, bad news for you. Um, and this is actually um, an interesting study um, from uh, the Framingham study. As you know, this is a study that began uh, in Framingham, Massachusetts, well over uh, half a century ago. And actually in Framingham, uh, they actually saw that uh, the incidence of dementia um, decreased over the last 30 years. Um, early diagnosis, more effective therapy, and perhaps uh, improvements in cardiovascular health indicators were attributed to some of the uh, reasons and factors, except for diabetes, for noticing um, there being at least some improvement um, in the Framingham cohort. But you know, um, I need not remind you that um, there are a limited number of um, African American and Hispanics um, in, in, in at least that cohort. And in fact, when you look at um, uh, Alzheimer's in uh, those particular cohorts, and this is, it doesn't show up as well, but African Americans are in green and Hispanics are in white, you actually see almost a doubling in terms of the, um, you know, this is a smaller study of the prevalence of Alzheimer's uh, in at least these particular risk groups. Um, so, so we recognize that you know there are good news in some cohorts, but um, there are other cohorts where um, clearly um, their impact. And maybe some of the things I'll talk about in terms of the social determinants of health 
may have some uh, implications, but it just actually helps to underscore how, um, at least in our society, um, there are specific conditions that have a disproportionate uh, impact uh, on different communities. And I think that this is sort of in, in keeping with um, some of the um, ideas that um, the Weiners, in terms of their passion, in terms of us, what we, we, we can do um, in this regard. And so the problem has, um, you know, a significant scope. And so Alzheimer's, as I mentioned, um, it, it's well over $160 billion, just this condition that we call heart failure. And what heart failure simply means is an inability of the heart to meet the peripheral oxygen demands. And you can see those numbers there. Now, one of the other messages I would like to share with you this morning is that there are probably um, a connection between Alzheimer's and heart failure. And I'm going to share with you the possibility that these are protein misfolding diseases. When you actually came to Grand Rounds this morning, you didn't necessarily think, well, gee, heart failure might be linked to Alzheimer's. I hopefully will be able to share. And what I'll also point out is that we know that some of the basic mechanisms, pathophysiology, and even therapies remain elusive goals uh, in the post-genomic um, era. Well, you know, I've actually been extraordinarily fortunate. Um, I'm a young man. I'm an immigrant. I came from a small country called Guyana in South America. I came here as a teenager, and um, I got excited about um, science. I got excited about medicine, and I've been extraordinarily fortunate to um, go to some fine schools. And this slide is just to point out that, um, like everyone in this room, uh, you know, your number one mentors are probably your parents. But when you sort of enter into uh, medicine, there have got to be some individuals who, who took an interest in you and who um, gave you um, sort of the confidence that you can begin to start um, you know, pursuing um, your, your passion. And my interest then you know, began to develop um, in, in, in doing basic research. And so thanks to a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation at the time, what they wanted to do was basically to promote um, African Americans um, who were not disproportionately um, not in, uh, fa on medical faculty. But they wanted to say, what is it we can do to enhance those numbers of individuals? And what that then means, meant is that, you know, besides, you know, studying cardiology, you, you had to become an investigator. And you can do population science, you can do clinical science, you can do basic science. But this is one of my earliest um, papers um, that was pu published um, with my mentor, um, Sandy Williams. Um, I must assure you that, um, you know, as much as this is uh, 19, this was published in, in, in 1990, you know, um, you know, I'm a little older here. You can see the history. <laughs> you can see. You can see. But but it was it, it was a nice picture. So 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 I've got I've got it there. So so we began to study, um, you know, a phenomena at the time that was called the heat shock response. And I'll tell you a little bit more. But this is a this is a a factor and a pathway that's involved in how cells respond to basic stress. And the first stress that uh, helped led to the discovery of um, this particular phenomenon was heat. But ischemic stress could also, if you will, be able to evoke this uh, particular pathway. So I got to sort of now give you a little bit more context of, um, of, of what I have been engaged with, at least intellectually and scientifically. So we got to talk a little bit more about protein folding because I think that this will sort of help to put in some context. Um, this, this, this doesn't show up here. Okay. So 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 we all know you know sort of central dogma of biology. You know DNA goes to RNA goes to protein. But when a protein is made, it still needs to be appropriately folded as well as to be able to achieve its appropriate tertiary and quaternary structure, whether it's going to be an ion channel, whether it's going to be a contractile protein. It really needs to be able to do that. And that's the role of a chaperone. So a chaperone helps to facilitate proper folding. Now, um, you know, I no longer have teenagers, but one way for you to think about the chaperone is that you're not going to send them off to camp without the chaperone. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to say anything more. <laughs> so, 
So, so that's what chaperones do. Chaperones are in all of our cells. They're strategically located in our mitochondria and our endoplasmic particulum. And they're there so that when proteins are basically coming off, they're able to basically get these proteins to appropriately fold. And you can see this is sort of like an energy landscape here. And this is what we will call, you know, an appropriate um, folded protein. And so you can see that um, proteins are here. They're in unfolded states. You know, the chaperone is there sensing matters. No, Johnny, you need to stay away from whoever and, uh, you know, fold properly. But, you know, some of these actually are, are going to be unproductive. And when you hear about amyloid fibrils and when you hear about amorphous black, these are the ones that have not successfully folded. And I will talk a little bit more about uh, pathways that our cells have for ridding itself for uh, events that are not folded um, productively. So I've already talked about that. So, so this brings up, if you will, this concept that we call proteostasis. And it's just a term that refers to cellular process in which cellular proteins are continuously being synthesized. They're being degraded in order for them to be ensure quality control and homeostasis of our protein. So, so we're making lots of proteins all, this, all the time, and cells have to really be able to basically um, have a way um, of uh, maintaining quality control. The same way that, you know, when you buy um, a product, you know, there is some, you know, QC person that's, or, or machine that's really doing it. Same is true in our cells. Well, um, this cartoon, if you will, gives a little bit more uh, context about the quality control pathways uh, in our cells. So let's just sort of take it from, uh, if you will, you know, the top. So here is um, a protein that's sort of coming off of a ribosome. Um, here could be one of, you know, where it's correctly folded. And it can even go into a vesicle. And so since we've got lots of electrophysiologists in the audience, you know, the Golgi is the pathway by which a cell, the vitreous protein, will ultimately go and insert into, you know, the cellular membrane. If protein is not favorable, we've got a pathway that we call the ubiquitin proteasome system to basically degrade those proteins. And, you know, you can get recycled gets a little bit more complicated <clears throat> because so, so, so we've, we've even been able to evolve additional systems. So you can see here is, here, here's the central reasons that we need chaperones and if we don't have them uh, working productively, and I'll show you a little bit more evidence of that, you will end up with a misfolded protein. Um, of course, proteins I've already described for you, the uh, unfolded uh, protein uh, pathway, the ubiquitin proteasome system. There is also something called chaperone-mediated, um, you know, disruption, as well as there are other pathways that involve vesicles that are called microautophagy and macroautophagy to be able to degrade proteins. Well, but the bottom line here is that there are a variety of strategies that exist in our cells to um, be able to maintain homeostasis of the protein, and um, this can really um, be um, pathways that um, we, um, we all use. But then the challenge is what happens when things go awry? And so if you take nothing away from today's lectureship, um, you know, a pitch is worth a thousand words. What's shown here on your left is a heart cell. And so shown there in yellow is a protein that's misfolded. So in sort of blue there is a, is a nucleus. You can see the striations of the heart cell. And I'll talk a little bit more about what happens when you have protein misfolded and aggregation in the heart cell. You can clearly see that these are neurons and these are neurofibrillar tangles. And the point I want to make is that a heart cell and a neuron are what we will call, if you will, post-mitotic. So um, there is evidence, without getting into all the details, that you know the heart has a little bit among the regenerative capacity. But your brain cells and your heart cells 
Once they're formed, they're there. And so this is really an important um, challenge. So, so cardiomyocytes in neurons are post-mitotic, low rates of turnover. So if you have an imbalance of proteostasis, you know, you've got a real challenge on your hand. And that's really part of what, um, you know, my laboratory has been interested in. And, of course, this is, th this is really the, the issue that, that has contributed to... to um, so, so, so let's just describe um, a little bit more about when uh, things don't work as well. So what I'm going to tell you here is a, um, a French pedigree with a mutation in a protein that's expressed in the heart that's called alpha B crystalline. But this protein is also expressed in other um, you know, organs and tissues, such as uh, in the lens, as well as in the cardiac muscle. And so this is a multi-system disease, and it's a protein misfolding disease. And when it's expressed in the heart, you can see here, you actually will have um, these kinds of, of aggregates. So this will be an example of, um, and but I should also, and I'll show you on the next slide, this is a, this is a chaperone that's, um, that's also uh, misfolded. So, 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 so this is to tell you a little bit more, of course, the heart is a mechanical pump. This is the protein that we um, studied. It's called cryab or alpha B crystalline. You can knock it out. You know, it's not an essential. You know, you can do gene targeting and you can knock it out. But it actually is somewhere between two to three percent of the soluble protein in the heart. It's a phosphor protein, and when we overexpress this protein in our heart, now this is a cartoon that actually shows a myofibril cell. So you can basically see these myofibrils here. And there are cables that actually help to tether myofibrils. And this is the plasma membrane, this is the nucleon. These are almost like shock absorbers. And so part, this protein really functions in helping to interact with intermediate filament proteins such as Desmond, just to maintain the integrity of the shock absorbers uh, in our muscle cells. And so what we're going to talk about is when you know, something um, goes awry, such as there being, um, if you will, a genetic mutation in this particular protein. And so um, we know that this is an autosomal dominant form of disease. Um, this is what's called the alpha crystalline domain. Um, there's a lot more details in this slide that um, you need to worry about. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an autosomal dominant, and it can actually have variable penetrance uh, in our tissues. So some of these patients, for example, can present with um, maybe heart block. They will need a pacemaker. They will even have um, cardiomyopathy. So um, in our laboratory, we decided to uh, better, try to better understand um, the pathogenesis of um, this particular mutation by modeling it um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a mouse. So this is not an obese mouse, but it's a mouse that actually has um, heart failure after we have introduced this mutant protein in the heart. And uh, the aficionados in the room will recognize that not only this is a bigger heart, but you can even see biatrial enlargement. And these are not, this is not atypical for what happens with our patients with cardiomyopathy and, and, and heart failure. And, and um, in, you know, in my laboratory, we were able to better understand, and Mohammed did mention about this concept of reductive stress most of us are used to thinking about oxidative stress. Well, oxidative stress is simply a condition where you have more pro-oxidants. And the way that we cope with oxidative stress is that we've got an enzyme here called glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. It generates a reducing equivalent that's called NADPH that's used as a cofactor by glutathione reductase to convert this oxidized glutathione to reduce the client to be able to basically be able to mitigate the oxidative stress. So this is what, if you will, uh, an imbalance uh, will occur when you don't have enough um, you know, glutathione to cope with increased oxidative stress. Well, what my laboratory described is this particular phenomenon where you now have excess amounts of reducing equivalents in the form of either glutathione or this NADPH. And so as much as you know, the field has spent a lot of time thinking about oxidative stress, we were able to make this particular contribution that this was causal. It wasn't just a consequence. It was a causal mechanism for this particular phenomenon that uh, we saw there. Just to make some final points about this, 
Um, so I showed you that there were aggregates already in cardiac cells, and here there are more aggregates. But here was the really cool experiment we did. We, are, we, we reasoned that if this glucose 6-phosphate you know, enzyme was hyperactive, maybe we can do an experiment to basically mitigate um, that particular process. So we took these myopathic animals and crossed them with an animal that have G6PD deficiency. And so you can see, so these are the myopathic animals. There are, most of them are all have died at 72 weeks. But when we cross that animal with G6P deficiency, we were able to at least have significant rescue, well over 60%. And by the way, those protein aggregates that were in the muscle cell were now able to be um, disappeared, and that contributed in part to this improvement. So what this argues is that, you know, if you have a protein folding problem, and it is partly being contributed by this, if you will, dysregulation of a uh, metabolic pathway, you can actually now be able, and this is the kind of thing that one needs to do in the laboratory, so that you can gain some particular insights to really be able to drive um, potential therapeutic in, you know, interests. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into more details, but G6PD is X-linked, and, and uh, these studies were obviously done in the particular males. So this is just, if you will, um, we've been extremely fortunate to um, be able to publish an area of this is a busy slide. It's not intended for, uh, I assure you that it's not going to be on, on, on one of your quiz that uh, I was asked to provide. <laughs> but <laughs> it's okay, you know, it's, you know, <laughs> just, uh, just saying. <laughs> but, um, but importantly, uh, this has really been a, an absolute fantastic uh, ride. So, so why not let me now, if you will, um, transition and, and, and talk about uh, some areas that um, I've become uh, increasingly not only uh, of interest to me, but I think it's of potential interest to you. And um, it's, it's, it's really you know, sort of one of the highlights of uh, my, my professional life. I will think that the highlight of my personal life is, um, of course, number one, getting married, and number two, having you know, three wonderful children. But um, it, it would say that um, being part of the American Heart Association, where I got my first grant, um, really has um, really been a, an absolutely fantastic ride and privilege. So some of the things that, you know, as AHA president, you begin to start thinking about is things such as these, you know, the sort of the age-adjusted mortality rates for cardiovascular disease and stroke. And as you can see um, in this particular um, cartoon, when you look at um, all CVD or even stroke or ischemic heart disease, it clearly disproportionately impacts um, particularly um, African Americans and potentially Hispanics uh, in our population. And so what this therefore means is that we need to be thinking a little bit more broadly about the social determinants of health. And by that, what I mean is for us to be thinking about the economic stability, access to affordable health care, some of the societal influences, as well as, you know, where people live, where people grow, where people send their kids um, to school. Um, these are some of the more critically uh, important uh, factors. And um, as you very well know, I mean, we are here at um, a VA hospital. I mean, I was a VA merit uh, awardee. Um, we were in Salt Lake City, both Mohammed uh, and I. We have, obviously, the Zablakti VA um, in Milwaukee. But importantly, um, we know that... Um, much of what we do, just in terms of the contributions to someone else, is about 20%. 80% of one's health are in all these other factors. And, and that means that we need to begin to start thinking a little bit differently in terms of this whole concept of, of, of health equity and how we can begin to start but not only narrowing the gap, but potentially be able to eliminate um, um, health uh, disparities. So when we think about health equity, it's actually a measure, it's a performance measure that can be linked to an intervention that reduces disparities in health and health care. And, and these are now becoming increasingly important issues, not just, so as physicians or as providers, uh, whether it be nurse practitioner, we have an important charge to do the best that we can for that patient who we're seeing and obviously, there are many aspects of um, medical care that's more team-based. But many of these issues, if you will, are much beyond just the individual provider. Almost whole 
uh, systems have to really be able to start thinking about that. And so, a, you know, a forum such as the National Quality Forum really is a mechanism of convening stakeholders uh, to sort of develop a roadmap that will des demonstrate how performance uh, measurements, you know, can best be able to implement the best policy um, for us to be able to think about eliminating disparities. And just to sort of share with this audience, that roadmap it means ways that we can basically potentially incentivize. Where do we need to better put investments? And how can we then be able to implement um, strategies by identifying the key priorities that will help again to drive health equity? And this has got profound consequences, um, not only for communities, for societies, but for our nation um, as a whole. So at the American Heart Association, as we sort of begin to start thinking for the next um, you know, 10 years, we actually begin to start talking about this concept that we call you know, a healthy life expectancy. And I'm gonna get into a little bit more details, uh, but here's where I'm talking about the number of years that a person can expect to live in full health which is a distinction to life expectancy that I'll get back to. But just as well, in a complementary way, um, it means that we're talking about well-being, a state of complete physical, uh, mental, and social well-being, and not merely, mean, if you will, the absence of disease. And, you know, I've already been describing what health equity, again, everyone deserves um, an optimal and just opportunity to have a healthy, um, you know, special living with attention being made, paid to those at greatest risk of poor health. And again, you know, social determinants of health means, again, where people grow, where people live. But just as importantly, we recognize that, um, you know, I mean, I live in Milwaukee, I live in Mequon, um, you know, my zip code, um, you know, is uh, with um, reasonably um, affluent uh, people. But, you know, if I drive 15 miles away um, to the 53206 uh, uh, zip code, uh, in, in Milwaukee, you know, the, you have uh, high rates of incarceration. Um, you've got significant um, burden in terms of health outcomes. And, and so we as a society need to be able to, if you will, think more broadly about um, not only our neighbor, but in terms of um, how we might be able to improve our communities. And so I'm proud of the American Heart Association really being able to think more broadly. Now to put a little bit more final point about this issue that I call healthy life expectancy. So here is actually a cartoon describing two individuals, Julie and Pamela. And let's sort of begin with the end in mind. And it, some of this might be cut off here. But you know, both Julie and Pamela live to be um, you know, 79 years of age. In Julie's case, you know, she was going along, um, you know, age 52, probably still actively working. Maybe Julie um, is a, uh, she's now a grandmother and she's not only helping uh, in terms of her own family, but she might even be helping out with grandkids. But then, you know, Julie got a stroke and then lived for another 27 years. On the other hand, you know, Pamela was successfully retired, um, you know, had a couple of European vacations, even taking her kids, you know, to uh, Disney World, you know, but then got her stroke and then passed away. The impact for Julie is quite different to the impact for Pamela in terms of families, in terms of multi-generational issues. And, and, and these are actually, these, these are, and so, so this idea about thinking about healthy life um, expectancy is one that uh, we're particularly focused on in the American Heart Association. That is to say, what is it we can do to increase not only the uh, length of life, but how are we gonna be able to delay or prevent the onset of disease? just as well for us to really be able to narrow this specific gap when we think of overall lifespan. This hits home. Neither of these two individuals are with us. I should know, they're my parents. But uh, I stand here with pride, recognizing that um, they are the ones uh, on whose shoulders I stand. My mother in particular um, was a stroke victim. In fact, my grandmother was a stroke victim. And the difference between caring for uh, the care that my grandmother received and my mother was received when I was an uh, intern at uh, Yale New Haven Hospital, she was able to get um, immediate um, rehabilitation such that uh, six months later, 
she and I were able to um, go off uh, uh, on a European vacation. Oh, by the way, I did offer my dad, but he said, go with your mom. <laughs> but, you know, I was so proud with her. I was actually able to, you know, walk up the stairs with her six months later and actually go into that little room, you know, in Amsterdam, Holland, where Anne Frank is. It was just the, it's the only thing that I remember, uh, among other th cool things. But, uh, yeah, but... but we now have phenomenal things in what we do for straight blues. We've got thrombectomy catheters. I mean, the care is absolutely phenomenal in terms of what we're able to do. But yeah, this is, this is, this is what I'm describing to you is, is, is real. It's probably real for me. It's probably real for your families. You know, um, at uh, yesterday's Grand Rungs, um, this is just to make uh, the point that uh, the single most risk factor for atrial fibrillation is age. And um, we have uh, both, and this is work from the Framingham, and be it for, for men and for women, um, one in four individuals over um, 80 is going to have uh, atrial fibrillation. And this remains uh, an important um, challenge. I should point out to you that my mother also had atrial fibrillation. And, um, you know, we need to be thinking about our aging population, and this is just, you know, I get a chance to go all over the world, but um, this is a challenge that uh, many societies uh, are facing. And as we are um, having aging in our population, we've got to think about more uh, issues related to cognitive impairment um, as well as uh, risk reduction. And this is just some evidence from the first three years of the SPRINT trial. This is a trial that um, led, was supported by the NHLBI addressing uh, blood pressure reduction and um, suggesting that you know, maybe there is a potential um, impact that lower blood pressure might have, at least on mild cognitive uh, import, uh, impairment. But just as importantly, um, we know that um, age-adjusted uh, mortality, stroke mortality, is, is, is something, and I've already shared um, some of this uh, with you. So the American Heart Association, if you will, has a, a new mission statement, and that new mission statement, uh, is to be a relentless force for a world of longer, healthier lives. I should point out to you that, you know, you notice that uh, heart is not uh, in that mission statement. That being said, since, you know, we're talking about uh, brain impairment, um, we want to be that relentless force for a world with fewer strokes and with healthier brains overall. Wouldn't that be phenomenal? Well, how are we going to go about doing that? Well, one of the first things, of, you know, the American Heart Association is this presidential advisory from um, about two years ago, just defining what is optimal brain health. And maybe we can come back and talk a little bit more about that. But we're beginning to have a better understanding through a number of um, studies, working with a number of collaborators. As you can see, um, I was uh, part of uh, the press release for this um, physical uh, activity guidelines that came out um, from HHS where um, we want to be able to, if you will, um, encourage um, healthier lifestyle. And some of that obviously is going to come through our commitment um, to research. And so this is just to show you some of what, um, of course, has uh, been happening um, in national effort. Um, as you know, many of you know, um, you know, President Trump uh, recommended that there be a reduction in the NIH budget um, just recently. But I've been on um, Capitol Hill lobbying on behalf of the American Heart Association, you know, um, you know, that, that, you know, arguing that, you know, one should increase the NIH budget. And by the way, thankfully, there may not be a lot of, um, there's a lot of fair amount of partisanship, partisanship in that space. But at the NIH, this is a bipartisan issue. We have consistently have had, over the last four years, a $2 billion increase in the NIH budget, so much so that um, we now are spending well over, um, you know, $4 to $1 billion. And, and, and I suspect that um, in this particular uh, case, uh, better minds and brains will prevail, and we're going to continue to get that, um, that increase. <laughs> so, so what else are we doing? So, you know, one of the real um, challenges, so I shared a little bit about my life is why, but, you know, Paul Allen, who just passed away within the last uh, few months, I think it was in October, his mom, mom had Alzheimer's disease. And through the Paul Allen uh, Frontiers Group, they have partnered with the American Heart Association. And we made available, you know, close to $43 million to study brain health and cognitive impairment. And these are some 
of um, the awardees um, that were announced at the um, last scientific um, meeting um, in Ch Chicago during um, the other people. Um, this is um, Kathy Richmond from the Allen Institute. This is Dr. Rosemary Robertson, who, uh, this is Dr. Richmond, Dr. Robertson, who is um, the Deputy uh, Chief Science Officers with the three investigators who were um, Dr. Cage, Dr. Weiss Corey, and Mukesh Jain, and they're individually and collectively studying some of the fundamental problems that will impact healthy, break, um, healthy aging. Impact the factors like proteostasis that I mentioned to you, uh, epigenomics, genomics, inflammation, even potentially uh, in facts of uh, the vascular, the neurovascular junction. So, so I shared with you two curves. We're making great progress with cardiovascular disease, but dementia and cognitive impairment, you know, except for Framingham, is obviously quite a challenge, and there are significant consequences in health disparities. So we think that um, supporting the best and brightest, and here's the other thing that was, um, I think, quite exciting, is that the first two uh, investigators are actually neuroscientists, and here's a cardiologist. And so maybe by bringing people who are looking at problems from different disciplines might be an opportunity for us to really make some potential impact. So I'm gonna to try to, um, I, I recognize, um, let me just share with you one last story in terms of, um, I've, I've talked a little bit about you know, funding here, but we recognize that you know, to care for patients, um, there are just so many, if you will, I mean, we're in the world of big data. And uh, in industry here, you've got newcomers like uh, Google and Amazon and many others. But here it is, the, you have the clinical investigator, we're gonna do, discovery science, there are this whole concept of learning healthcare systems, and all of these are actually gonna be interdigitated on new ecosystem that involves lots of data in order for us to really be able to care for our, for, for our patients. But I'm also passionate about being sure that uh, the same kinds of opportunities that I have had um, is also there and it's available for all particular uh, comers uh, in this particular case, and that's the issue of uh, the diversity of the biomedical uh, workforce. Uh, very proud of the American Heart Association. We recognize there are a number of target audiences. You can target people in medical school, high school, but some of it we actually commissioned by the Rand Corporation, and here are some evidence that actually came out. It actually turns out in terms of declared measures, if you're white, black, they're all actually declared at just about the same rates. But when you look at STEM graduates, there's this huge drop off. And uh, we have elected then to invest resources um, for STEM undergrads for us to, if you will, to close um, the health equity gap. I've, I've shared with you a little bit of why I'm standing here. I was very fortunate to have had um, grants from uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. This is Harold Emmos who uh, named this uh, uh, funding mechanism for the last 30 years, but. He was uh, one of the first um, African-American um, department chairs of microbiology at Harvard. And, and I think that we need to continue to really be able to provide similar opportunities. I'm just as well as concerned. In 1978, when I entered Johns Hopkins Medical School, there were only about 1,400 applicants. It actually turns out um, just two years ago, that number is even lower. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's an important challenge. I can't emph emphasize to you the importance of uh, mentoring, and that's really been, and, and we all, in fact, you know, this is of interest to, to and I'm so gratified, Mohammed, to have that conversation with the fellows yesterday. It's, 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 it's uppermost on their mind, and I think that this is quite fantastic that um, this kind of enthusiasm is obviously being shared right here. What else would one expect from a pre premier academic uh, institution um, just as yours? So I'm about to wrap up, but um, what I must tell you that um, at the American Heart Association, we have invested a substantial amount of effort. This is, what, this is a particular forum that we call sort of the Research Leaders Academy. And the idea is that we wanna be somewhat purposeful about cultivating uh, the leaders uh, for tomorrow. So I really bringing in uh, more uh, established, I didn't say senior, <laughs> leaders as well as uh, or, or early career, but just as well, bringing in people who are sort of thinking out of the box. Dr. Robert Wallinger is um, now the director of um, the Harvard study, which is sort of studying um, happiness in um, Harvard medical school graduates. And just in terms of 
really being able to think about um, how that might be able to see them, you know, in this sort of topsy-turvy world with um, pressures from the EMR, um, not enough time to get all your regulatory issues in. Um, you need to be basically get um, higher numbers of WR we use. By the way, all these things are important. Don't get me wrong. But yet we still want people to be excited and engaged and be thinking about, you know, how can we be able to, to, to drive this. And last but not least, let me just say that um, it's been an enormous privilege to be here with you this morning, in part because the care of the future is ours. Thank you very much. Thank you, and so very pertinent at this time. Questions for the audience? Chuck, <laughs> Dr. Stone. <laughs> I just had a more technical question. I hope you don't mind. I do not. So, so even without a microphone, I hope everyone heard the question, which is uh, an extremely important one. Uh, should we be developing tools and techniques to deal with the problem more upstream, rather than, if you will, you know, when it's sort of the horse is out the barn and you now have plaques that are in the extracellular space? And you're absolutely right. You know, when I actually give this talk, this is really the thing that I would emphasize. Um, we simply need a new way of thinking. The overwhelming likelihood, I mean, I'm not suggesting at all, but you know, it's those kinds of questions that you identified, Dr. Stoner, are absolutely critical. And so maybe we need to have uh, the bioengineers, maybe we need to have new sensing ways that we can basically discover misfolded proteins in cell. There's got to be a whole uh, technology and a whole science in order for us to really be able to visualize uh, non-invasively, uh, because I don't think that people are very interested in getting biopsy with their brain or their heart, <laughs> you know, in these particular circumstances. But yeah, and, and I think that this will also emphasize the fact that we need to get other, um, if you will, uh, stakeholders in the room to tackle these kinds of intractable problems. But we, by the way, this underscores the value of, 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 of the clinician. You know, we know what the problems are. What we've got to really be able to do is to, is to get uh, more of those individuals. And what a final thing I want to say is that you're at UW-Madison. You're part of a university system. We're not just at the medical center. This medical center sits smacking with people who are thinking about material science, people who are thinking about small molecules and getting a variety of players. That's the power of a university. And I can only, you know, encourage more for, you know, you know, Houston, are you listening? Uh, for, for you to really be able to maybe think about how you use seed grants so that you can really get disparate disciplines coming together to think about and tackling those problems such as yours. Yes, hands up there. Fascinating, yes, yeah, but no, I mean that's that's a that, that's a good point um, that you raise. Um, albumin is very abundant, um, but you know I showed you some of the pathways that are involved uh, with misfolding, and you're absolutely right. Think about biomarkers or surrogates that might um, be able to reflect. Um, that's exactly the kind of thinking that we should be encouraging. Yes, over here.
So, 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 so the question is, um, um, do misfolded proteins provide some, um, you know, uh, surrogate for uh, molecular mimicry, and is there a potential for there to be autoimmune disease? Um, really insightful question. In fact, part of um, the, 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 the studies, uh, particularly by um, Weiss Corey, um, at Stanford is looking at the whole question uh, about the consequences of, of inflama inflammation, and particularly even autoimmunity in um, being able to um, mediate potential uh, cognitive impairment. You know, the molecular you know, mimicry was something that was out there for a couple of decades ago. I haven't seen a whole lot more in terms of what that is, um, in terms of the implications for cognitive impairment um, and, and, uh, and Alzheimer's. But, but definitely, you asked a two-part question, um, you know, uh, studying uh, the etiologic factors associated with inflammation in cognitive impairment. And by the way, that's just as important in cardiovascular disease too, right? And so, so yeah, so this is, your, this is really at the ground floor. You know, when you think about immunotherapy, where in terms of the cancer field, um, I've always argued that um, as cardiologists and cardiovascular investigators, we are sort of uh, behind the curve. You know, just all kinds of ways that people are, you know, um, manipulating the immune system uh, in terms of tackling and treating cancer. Any further questions? Thank you very much. Your pardon. <laughs>